This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit luptoncapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. My name is Jonah Lupton. I am your host. Uh, Please help me welcome our guest today, Tom Hayes. He is the chairman and managing member or partner of Great Hill Capital. Yeah, that's right. Managing member. Great to be with you, Jonah. Thanks for having me. There you go. Uh, Now, Great Hill Capital is a long, short hedge fund. Yeah, we uh, we run separately managed accounts for uh, ultra high net worth and small institutions. Uh, we're kind of value oriented, but quality value with growth. We don't get uh, we don't like to be bagged in uh, value traps. Uh, so uh, so we could talk a little bit about that. But we like compounders that are out of favor. Give us an example. I mean, I'm not sure how, if you can talk specific positions or not. Hopefully, yeah. You- um, well, I'll give you an example that's been pretty controversial uh, for the last six months or so is Alibaba, okay? No one wants to touch it with a 10-foot pole. This is a business that you can buy at IPO prices from 2014. The, you know, they've compounded capital at uh, double digits uh, throughout that entire period. They've grown revenues 800%. They've grown earnings and cash flow 500%. And you can't give the stock away and you can buy it at the same price 14 years ago. So you could say, well, the multiple was too high, too high when they were an IPO. Okay, that's fair. But it's certainly too too low now when you consider the sum of the parts. So the overhangs obviously are geopolitical, some trade war rhetoric with the with the uh, politicians. You had the country basically locked down and people locked in their apartments literally for three years, uh, and that's changing. And people are like, wait a second, you know the co- country's reopening. Why haven't all their numbers doubled? But they've been reopened for twelve weeks. So uh, we are seeing it last week with the GDP numbers shot the lights out. Uh, the retail sales numbers shot the lights out. And that's why we're not only constructive on businesses like that. We, you know, we think this is one of the most uh, no-brainer discounts to intrinsic value uh, globally, okay, in terms of an equity business. And now that they're breaking it up, they have the ability to IPO different pieces of the business. You're going to see that. I mean, just today, um, there was an article in the South China Morning Post that uh, Alibaba has... 36% share of the cloud market. They just signed another big deal with a state-owned enterprise, which, which is an implicit nod from the government, which is a, a very good thing to see. Uh, and the cloud business uh, is going to triple by 2025, if you believe McKinsey's uh, industry outlook, which we do. So at 36% share, I mean, that business alone uh, is going to increase operating cash flow uh, by 66% above where it was trading when it was trading at $319 a share. So those are the type of things. And we're willing to sit through these periods of extreme despondency and pessimism. So we're kind of uh, acolytes of Ben Graham and Warren Buffett. You know, it's a voting machine in the short term. It's a weighing machine in the long term. And we've attracted the type of partners that um, are 100% on board with that and understand intrinsic value of a business. And we don't, we don't get swayed by day-to-day or week-to-week uh, prices, provided nothing has changed in the underlying business operations. And if anything, the underlying business operations have improved in spite of one of the worst environments, once in a hundred year events when you consider COVID. Uh, so, so we like that type of business. Uh, and there are a couple others that are probably gonna uh, uh, cause some surprise and awe amongst your audience uh, as we go through them. So real quick, I mean, I've been around for over 20 years investing. I've seen companies break up into three pieces. I've seen companies spin off units like Johnson & Johnson right now is you know doing their roadshow for one of their healthcare units they're going to spin off. I've never seen a company break into six pieces. Like that's, yeah. that's pretty wild. So is it going to be individual IPOs they spin off one by one or are they just going to break up the company? And if you own Baba shares, now you're going to own shares in six different companies. Yeah, it's they. It's been unclear, and we'll get more color on on earnings. However, we are seeing the early stages, like Freshipo, which is the uh, kind of the equivalent of Costco in China, that people owners have attributed basically zero value to this business. That could be the next Costco in the fastest growing, largest market. So they're IPOing that alone, 
uh, for $10 billion valuation. And that's just get out of the gate. And then what then they can raise capital. So I think initially they're going to do a few of these IPOs and they're going to hold major ownership stakes in it. So you'll get that benefit through your ownership of, uh, of Alibaba. And then I think there will be some that get spun uh, over time. And that's a good thing. If you've been around, you know, Greenblatt's uh, little book that beats the mark, uh, little book that beats the mark. You, you can be a stock market genius where he talks about uh, the empirical data about how spinoffs uh, outperform the parent over time because initially they get sold off by institutions who don't want to own it, but they're set up and they, they tend to dramatically outperform. So we love spins. Uh, we love I wish, I wish we saw more of them in the US. Like, for instance, you know, app, maybe not Apple. I mean, I guess Apple could break off, you know, services unit, for instance. But I think like Amazon could spin off AWS. Uh, uh, Microsoft could spin off something because they're, you know, they're yeah. such a conglomerate in so many different areas. Uh, of course, Meta could spin off Instagram and, and Google could spin off YouTube. I don't think those companies would ever do it on their own unless they were forced to by, uh, you know, Congress, regulators and whatnot. But uh, it would be exciting to own some of those parts rather than the whole company. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when, when you consider Amazon, which we also uh, hold, by the way, so we, we like, we like, you know, Amazon was down when we bought it, I think 55% off of its pandemic peak. Uh, we're coming into earnings here. We own um, Alphabet, I think got down like 50% off of its pandemic peak. Uh, we don't own any Apple. We don't own any Microsoft. They just didn't get cheap enough for us. I think you get a... a I'm, I'm the same way. If I had to own any of the mega caps, and I don't own any right now, but I think Google and Amazon are the two that I would own. Yeah. So you have a similar type of bent in, in that you like grow quality, but you you like it marked down. And uh, and that that was the opportunity served up. So, you know, we missed uh, NVIDIA, but NVIDIA, we just couldn't get our arms around. We bought Intel at 25. It's now what, 30 to 32. I don't know what it is today. Uh, so we're betting on, we're not betting on Gensler's, uh, Gelsinger's, pipe dream, which by the way, we think is actually more than a pipe dream. We actually think if anyone can deliver on the outlook, it would be Gelsinger. Uh, he was schooled uh, under Grove, who, the guy who basically built Andy Grove, who basically built Silicon Valley. So this is a guy, you know, when you think about the uh, 486, he architected that. And our initial play is, okay, we know that uh, inventory is built because all the PC and server demand got pulled forward to, to two or three years ago. That's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, we're at the point, and from the data that we look at, that uh, inventories are at peak or, or close to peak. So just on their commodity server and PC business, which they you know, control, certainly PCs, uh, we think we're at the tail end of that inventory peak. And just on that alone, there's a lot of juice in the stock. And then if if Gelsinger actually delivers on being able to design and, and produce uh, these high quality chips that are going to be beneficial with AI and some of the things that NVIDIA is doing. AI, AI is the magic word. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's a free option. And uh, I'll believe it when I see it. But in the meantime, you know, I, I can make off of $25, I can make, you know, at least a double over three years. That That's worthwhile. And then if Gelsinger's Promises or anything close to true, maybe you have a ninety hundred dollars stock three to five years out. That's pretty valuable with uh, downside protection and um, so so stuff like that. Why do you like Amazon? So I did own Amazon off of the lows and then sold it just you know take a quick profit. Uh, and I just believe it's going to be a pretty strong free cash flow story over the next three, four, five years. Why do you guys yep. like? Yeah. So, I mean, when it was down 55, it was basically trading at 2018, 55%. It was trading at 2018 levels. However, they tripled the ad business. They tripled the AWS business. They had doubled the e-commerce business. They had grown prime subscribers from 100 to 165 million over that period. So you're getting, you know, double to triple the business for the same price, number one. So you could say, well, it was overvalued in, in 2018. So where did they screw up? They screwed up because demand went through the roof during COVID. They overexpanded the warehouses. They overexpanded the hiring. They overexpanded the costs. And they're now pairing all of that back. And we're seeing them, you know, shut that down, lay off people, et cetera. And then you, you're compounded with the fact that enterprise spending slowed in Q4 particularly. We're seeing some little green shoots. Maybe things got a little better in Q1, but let's not have any faulty expectations. Let's assume 
Q3, Q4, Q1 of next year, it starts to come back. So we, we look forward to their guidance this week. Uh, my guess is it will be murky. Uh, uh, and if it's anything less than murky, uh, the stock could get bid. But uh, we, uh, a week to week or a few months, it's, you know, we bought it with a large enough margin of safety. If it retraces the recent uh, bounce and, and retests before it goes higher for the long term, we can live with that. But uh, if you get any upside surprise, because expectations are so low, uh, you know, I, I was joking on, on a hit that I did uh, that the key to happiness in, in life is low expectations. It's also the key to happiness in earnings season. And uh, expectations couldn't be much lower coming into this earnings season, negative 6.3%. Uh, so if they say anything along the lines uh, that uh, enterprise spending could be firming up on the AWS, uh, this thing could, be, could get a nice bid. I mean, could they pull, because Meta stock got hammered after Q3 earnings because they really didn't lower their CapEx spending expectations. And then a couple of weeks later, they came out and said, okay, we're going to reduce CapEx. We're going to do our first you know, reduction of the workforce by 13,000 or whatever the number was. And they've done a couple of rounds since then. Is, is that sort of Amazon's, is that Amazon's moment right now to do something similar? I, I, I agree with you. And I think they've been, been doing it preemptively uh, coming into earnings. So uh, if their results are not where they think the street wants them to be and where, where investors expect them to be, probably the way to salvage that would be to be in, you know, to, to do another announcement in concert with bad earnings. And people will say, OK, they're on top of it. They're fixing it. They're going to get their margins back. But that might be a rearview mirror story. And I think uh, maybe we'll see, you know, no one has a modicum of positive expectations going into the call. So they'd really have to do terrible things and have terrible guidance for the stock to get pounded in, in our view. And if, and, if, and if you have something positive come out, whether it's guidance, whether it's uh, margin improvement, whether it, it could be a multitude of things or uh, prime subscribers, et cetera. Any of those things could be like people say, well, the business is actually no longer deteriorating. They're getting their costs under control and give them the benefit of the doubt of the next couple quarters of softness. Uh, and, and you could find a bit in the stock. But we're looking at this in terms of, you know, we bought it down 55 percent. Our view was over 36 months. We could have a double. And if we're lucky, maybe a little more than that. So if it goes down before it goes up, not the end of the world. If it goes up now and it happens faster than we expect. That's great. Uh, you know, we have enough taxable accounts. We'd rather it takes over twelve months to get the double. <laughs> when you guys start a position, are you typically looking at it as a potential two, three year hold? Yeah, yeah. In client accounts, uh, we want to be. Our horizon is twelve to forty eight months. Uh, uh, if we're right, we're usually out in twenty four months. If we're wrong, it takes thirty six or forty eight kind of thing. And uh, but you know, back to the point about the market being a voting machine and a weighing machine. All you can do is your analysis of the underlying business and your analysis of what the actual intrinsic value is relative to where it's trading in the marketplace. Um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a good friend. Uh, we were at a hockey game this weekend and uh, we were talking about Florida real estate. And I was like, why don't you just go around to like 10 properties and just offer like 0.60? Uh, you know, 60% of uh, ask and see what happens because, you know, their, their prices started to come down like 10, 12%, whatever it was in the case Schiller in, in his area. And uh, he's like, you know, I just can't uh, look people, you know, in the face and, and do that. I feel terrible. I was like, <laughs> you might, you might get like, punched by somebody. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I said, well, you have no problem buying uh, Alibaba at a 30, 33% of uh, intrinsic value. Why would you have a, a, a problem offering uh, 0.6x of, of a home value? He's, and he's like, I was like, that's what email's for. You know, send the offers out of 10. You may get one. You may get one at 0.7x. Uh, but, but what I love about the public markets more than the private markets, the bad news is you get marked to market every single day. The good news is you get offers laid out to you, Jonah, that uh, would never be seriously considered in the private markets. You know, if you went to if, if JP Morgan said, listen, uh, we're going to give you a credit line. If you can find a high quality business to buy at 33 percent of intrinsic value and you can prove it out to us and it's a proven business, we'll extend you 200 billion dollars. Go buy a business that's worth 600 billion or a trillion and you walked into Alibaba's boardroom and you said, look, I'd like to uh, 
offer you $200 billion for the six parts of your business, would you be interested? They would cart you out with security. Like if you offered them the amount that the business is trading in the market right now, you would be like probably arrested by the Chinese communist police. Like it would be so insulting. You'd have to pay probably a 50, 60% premium just to have them listen to you. Just to get to the meeting. Right. Absolutely. You'd have to be like, look, a half a trillion dollars. I know it's under mar- under intrinsic value, but let's talk it through. And you probably come in somewhere at 600. And that's if the board was scared. If the board was logical, they'd say, look, we don't care about the public markets right now. We know what this business is worth over the next three to five years. And if you come in with anything less than a T on it, uh, go pound sand, like, you know, save your first class air miles. You know, we're not interested. All right. It's probably the same thing that the Facebook board would have said, you know, at the lows a few months ago, you know, looking at the business, yeah, it's not a high growth business anymore, but, you know, it still generates 40, 50, 60 billion dollars a year in in free cash flow. And all they have to do is turn a couple, turn a couple knobs, you know, lay off some people, reduce CapEx, and you have a pretty profitable business again. All right, Joan, I got to ask you, did you eat your lunch yet? Or are you eating it after this uh, uh, video cast? Because I got one that that might repeat on you here. Uh, I have not eaten lunch yet. <laughs> All right. We, we, you, you ready for this one? Yeah. All right. So what's the most hated pocket of the market right now that you couldn't give away with it you know, to anyone? Uh, no one would take it. SPACs? Close. Former, former SPACs. You, <laughs> SPACs is one, uh, but that's kind of yesterday's Kathy news. Kathy Wood what? stocks, uh, energy Kathy. maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, energy people are still a little infatuated, but uh, how about commercial real estate? Would that oh, yeah, would that sure. would that oh, give yeah. up your lunch? <laughs> All right. So so I want to talk to you about one name that we so during the banking, whenever there are periods of dislocation, I get really interested. Okay. When people are running out of the theater, uh yelling fire, I'm I'm running in to see if someone left their wallet on the seat or something like that. So uh I think that's what's happened in commercial real estate. Now, that doesn't mean we don't recognize the problems coming down the pike and the trillion dollars of refinancing and the regional. Uh, exposure, et cetera. But the thing about beachfront property uh, is that it's always beachfront property. And whether there's a recession in the short term that people don't buy as many vacation homes, they're always going to come back and they're always going to want that beachfront property. As a matter of fact, I remember the first hedge fund I worked for, uh, the, uh, the, the principal was a very wealthy guy and he was telling, telling me the story of his friend during the great financial crisis. He called up the real estate agent and said, how many properties do you have listed above $5 million? Now this was 15 years ago. So that was a big property back then. And she said like 30 and he goes, okay, I offer 1 million on all 30. (laughs) And uh, he bought six. (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) Okay. So, uh, so the point I'm making is uh, one, so there was there was kind of that mini banking crisis last month, and it may not be over. For oh, you're talking so 15 years ago. Oh, you're talking the GFC. The GFC right. was the Hampton story, but but I'm I'm creating the context for this thing just so you can you know hold down some of your breakfast before I get into it. Uh, um, so basically, right now you can't give away commercial real estate in aggregate. People don't you know, and and the worst subsector of that is office property because people are convinced that everyone is going to work from home forever and the game has changed and it's uh, secular, et cetera. So last month when you had the banking crisis, I always look for how do you take advantage? There's always opportunity in the crisis. And I think you live by that as well, Jonah. Um, But I didn't want to buy regional banks because the government didn't solve the problem that they created effectively. So they jammed their, you know, they raised rates 500 basis points in 12 months. They blew up the portfolios. Yes, they should have been hedging. Yes, they should have managed it. But like, even if you think about SVB, average duration of 5.7 years, they weren't complete cowboys. I mean, they could have managed it better. But the problem was- Right, they weren't buying buying 30-year bonds. Right. You know, it it wasn't CMBS. You know, they got all these deposits at the exact wrong time during COVID. And they had to put them to work in the exact worst environment when the Fed funds rate was zero. So, you know, what, I, I mean, in some sense, they would have been, so long story short, uh, I didn't want to do that because the only way to backstop that problem would have been to do some type of te- temporary guarantee on deposits. Until then, you don't know what the outflows are going to be. Now, arguably, the, the, the outflows have stopped, et cetera, but well, there we, will be we, rip- We've seen all it takes is a couple of well-known VCs to say, get your money out. And all of a sudden you have a, a run on the bank 
and 50% of the deposits disappear in two days, you know, or yeah. something like that. Right. Yeah. No, that's exactly it. So when you have these periods of dislocation, uh, I don't always look to the, the first derivative. I look for what else could benefit, uh, you know, kind of like on earnings, you probably do some type of sympathy trades. Like if, uh, you know, if uh, Intel reports good earnings, maybe you buy Dell, you know, so, yeah, something I mean, silly. A couple of weeks ago on running reported great earnings. And then you saw Decker's because Decker's owns Hoka. Decker started to rally off of it. Yeah. So I didn't want to buy regional banks. So Bank of America came down enough. That was a no brainer. We bought some of Bank of America. But the other thing we bought was Vornado. Okay. Vornado is New York City real estate. Now, this is not SL Green that has BNC properties, uh, you know, in ABC City or in uh, or, or downtown or anything like this. This is Park Avenue. This is Fifth Avenue. This is Madison Avenue. This is where JP Morgan's building their new headquarters. This is where uh, you know all the Colgate is is headquartered. This is where Fox Fox News uh, headquarters is on Sixth Avenue. So is Fifth, Steve, Sixth, Steve Madison. Roth, even Roth still running Vernado? Yeah, he's eighty. So he and his proxies. And and right. my my general view is: look, this is the best operator in the business, and I'm sure he's got the right proxies around him. Uh, if they didn't take him out on a stretcher during the great financial crisis when when the banks were toast, uh, the big banks, uh, he he's, he'll make it through. And he sold off some properties in the last 24 months. He's got cash. He's going to be able to benefit from this. But kind of back to the bank, to the Baba story, this is similar in that and even the Amazon story um, from pre-pandemic levels of 2019, the revenues for Vernado, revenues per share are down about 4.9%. Uh, percent. Okay. The funds from operations are down about 9.9%. Uh, book value per share is down about uh, 16%. Okay. The stock is down 75%. Is it down that much? Wow. Yes. I it's trading. It a long time. It, it's trading at great financial crisis levels. Wow. Okay. So it's trading like it's BK, but you go to investor relations and go look at their property portfolio and you tell me, you know, even if half the country never steps into an office again, I can guarantee you the buildings that they own, the greatest buildings in the greatest city in the world, are always going to find some demand. Even if even if the rents go down a little bit, because rather than it, you know, uh, only uh, you know, uh, housing Green Hill Investment Bank and Evercore ISI and you know Bernstein, uh, maybe they've got to go down a tier, and and the groups like. Uh, Stiefel, who would never be in on Fifth Avenue, now can get into Fifth Avenue. Wh whatever it happens to be, the the point, the fact of the matter is, those buildings are always going to be top bid. Those are the beachfront property for office. And I think the example, and you probably lived through this. You remember four or five years ago, there was a very similar situation with malls, and people were saying, you know, they had all these uh, pictures of all these malls that were deteriorating around the country, and you had A class, you had B class, and you had C class. Here's, here's the thing. Just like commercial property, I think all the bears are probably correct uh, in that uh, in the time of the mall debacle, most of those B and C properties did get wiped out and they are abandoned and those REITs no longer exist. However, the best of the best, which Simon Property manages that have Apple, that have Lululemon, that have all the top tier stores, they're doing better than ever and they've done perfectly fine uh, through this situation, and even managed through COVID when all the stores were closed. So it tells you the quality of the business that they owned. And I think the same is true with commercial real estate. I tend to be more constructive on the idea that uh, a greater percentage of people will go back to the office than they think or than the market thinks right now. And that's particularly because this tight labor market is loosening and is loosening pretty aggressively. And I've talked to a few CEOs over the last few weeks a uh, couple public company, a couple private company that have laid off between 10 and 20% of their sales force. And uh, off the record in, in all of those cases, it's uh, it's always the work from home people they cut because it's a piece of cake. They're not part of the team. You know, they're not in the collaboration mode and they just, it's the, you know, they can never explicitly disclose that, but those are the easy cuts for them. And those are the ones that they're taking first. And people are sniffing this out. And I think if they start to get worried about losing their job, they're all going to rush into the office to get FaceTime uh, and, and reintegrate uh, in the group and the collaboration and the spontaneity and all the good things that come from that.
what do you think happens over the next few years? You know, let's say a company is in New York City and they have 10 floors in a building uh, and some people are still working from home. They've done some layoffs. Do you think they stay in the building and just give up a couple floors when they? Yeah, I think these? I think that is the thesis. And, and our our thesis is predicated upon um, if you're taking less space, you're probably going to want to be in the better buildings with what you have left. So it's like you don't want to. Right. Instead of, down, instead of you, eight you don't, floors in the B building, let's take five floors in the A building. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it, you know, if we can do that because it'll be closer to Grand Central, more people will want to come in. You know, you got to consider B and C's are probably further away from public transport. Uh, so they've got to get off the subway, take a cab or t- uh, get, uh, take, get off their trains, take a subway, take an Uber, take a cab. Uh, whereas the A properties are like right next to Grand Central. They can walk to the building. It's a gorgeous building. They're actually going to want to come to work because it's a really exciting place. It's it's not some kind of dumpy, dingy thing. And, and, and when you have, you know, when you're bringing clients into the office, there's a big difference yeah. between bringing a client to an A building and bringing a client to a B or C building. No question about it. And And that's kind of our thesis there. So we're not, we don't think the bearishness around commercial real estate is entirely wrong. I think it might be overblown. Like, I think you could probably get away with an SL green that has some B and C exposure, but we're not, we don't take those bets. So for instance, you know, Alibaba, it's like, yeah, we love the company on a granular basis, but it's really our emerging markets bet. And our emerging markets bet is basically our weak dollar bet. So we're looking for ways to benefit from the dislocation, short-term dislocation in emerging markets. So how are we going to do that? We're not going to go into China and buy some small and mid-cap company and, and flip a coin that it's not an accounting fraud. You know, our our view is that if if you know, even when the government was being unreasonable last year, our view was that it was mutually assured destruction. If they destroyed Alibaba, they were going to destroy the Communist Party. Uh, you can't make that bet with um, you know a Chinese car maker or a Chinese uh, delivery service or something smaller. Uh, but you can make that bet with Alibaba. As goes Alibaba, so goes China, so goes the country, so goes et cetera. Uh, it would be the equivalent of the U.S. government shutting down Boeing. I mean, it's just a completely bad idea from a self-interested uh, point of view. What's going on with Ant Financial? Because that was supposed to be a big IPO a couple of years ago. It, it, will that still go public at some point? or they? It looks, yeah. So... Um, Number one, they put one of the, I think the former uh, lady who ran the Hong Kong exchange on the board, like six, you know, three or four months ago, then uh, Jack Ma. This, this all sort of stemmed from Jack Ma pissing off the CCP, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but, but now he's back in good graces because, you know, he came back into the country. The, the Chinese government realized they went over the edge. They had to, you know, reinstill confidence. Jack Ma comes back. The country announces uh, the uh, Alibaba announces the the split, which is a nod from the government. Uh, and then, as far as Ant Financial goes, he gave up the voting control. So historically, there's a rule that they have to wait 12 months to IPO after a change of control. Maybe there will be some exception for that. I'd rather let them run it the way it's running for the next 12 months and let the economy just crank so that when they IPO, the numbers are big. And you know we won't see 300 billion valuation, but if we see 150 out of the gate, um, then as the business grows and improves, then we can start to get you know higher multiples and, and as capital floods back into the emerging markets, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you've seen some of the JP Morgan uh, notes where they have... Uh, U.S. versus ex-U.S. equity cycles and the outperformance, and you see the tables, but you you basically see U.S. Out- equity outperformance like kind of peaking, and every you know five to eight years, and then ex-U.S., which is basically emerging markets and Europe, start to outperform. And I think we're at that stage. You know, the table is set correctly with the dollar starting to come off the boil as of October. Uh, if you look, if you overlay the U.S. dollar with emerging markets for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you'll see dollar goes down, emerging markets go up. Uh, China is the biggest weight in emerging markets, uh, like 37, 38 percent. And then Alibaba is one of the biggest weights within China. So if you're if you believe the dollar will remain subdued or even go lower, uh, 
and you want exposure, our view was that Alibaba was the best leveraged way to play it. And now you've got the reopening and you've got all that stuff behind it. If you wanted to add additional exposure to international emerging markets, would you pick more individual names or just buy the ETFs? Great question. Um, probably, yeah, I mean, I would, I would consider buying Tencent, but that's a little bit too much. I was, was going to ask you about Tencent if you've looked at it. I haven't looked yeah, at it recently. Yeah, uh, so. it's a little too much overlap for me with Alibaba. And I, you know, I don't know if you play poker, but I like a lot of outs and I like the six parts and I like, um, I like the optionality with Alibaba relative to the, the current value ascribed to each of those six parts. Um, I mean, we, you always hear the, the term, you know, it's worth the, the sum of the parts is worth more than the whole. Yeah. And we've never seen more <laughs> sum of the parts than we're about to see with, with Baba. So yeah, yeah, no, no question. Um, so I think you could get away with doing like just, you know, buying an emerging markets ETF, which is basically buying an overweight to China. We're starting to look a little bit at some individual companies in Brazil, but we haven't done anything in size yet. We don't have that level of confidence with Lula in, in office. Uh, but that's probably the next place that we look. India's already kind of had a run into this because they didn't have uh, as severe of uh, lockdown restrictions as China did. So, you know, I hate to say it, it's just, it, it's the ugliest, but it, it has the most potential upside is, is high quality businesses in China. But it's got to be, big companies. I wouldn't be playing in mid cap, small caps, no matter how exciting the story, no matter how beautiful the numbers look, I would just go with the bellwether because it's marked down enough. It's going to trade like a small cap would in a normalized environment once things start to go. Right. No, I agree with you. I agree. Uh, what, what else do you like in the US? What are a couple other names that you can talk to us about real quick? Yeah. Uh, so we talked about Bank of America. We talked about, you know, okay, so here's an ugly one. Uh, <laughs> There's a common theme here. Uh, 3M, it's a train wreck because it's got the litigation overhang of the forever chemicals and the earplugs uh, that were used in battle. You saw the Department of Defense come out and say that um, uh, the, the people, you know, the sample of people who use the earplugs that were uh, attributed uh, people getting deafness or hearing impairments. Uh, there was no meaningful difference between a normal sample of people who didn't use the earplugs. So that bodes well for uh, a, a constructive outcome on that. And then the forever chemicals, uh, this is, you know, this has been a problem for a while. Uh, if you look at the worst case scenarios, you have ridiculous analysts saying it's $100 billion of exposure. You have reasonable analysts saying it's 10 or $14 billion of exposure. The key thing is, if I look at the worst case reasonable scenario, which would be $30 billion, it sounds like, oh, wow, you know, this isn't that huge of a company. That's a lot of money. But it's not paid all at once, number one. So if you consider over a decade and the stock is down, you know, some 50% plus off of, uh, off of the ties with this litigation overhang, this is a unique business, Jonah, Jonah in that this business has been compounding capital, return on invested capital. <laughs> A double digits and, and in the 20s for years and years and years. This is a high quality business with a moat. The, the overhang. 3M, are they post-it notes? Post-it notes, uh, safety stuff. If you go into the hospitals, they have, you know, uh, equipment. Uh, they have uh, technology. They have, it's it's a it's an uh, industrial con conglomerate. Okay. But yes, post-it notes is what they're known for on the retail side. But the amount of stuff that they supply, safety stuff to all different industries is, is just staggering. Um, so this has been a long-term compounder. Okay. So the point is if you got a worst case outcome with the forever chemicals, which won't happen tomorrow, but let's say they settled at $30 billion, which I think it's going to be a lot lower, but let's it's just huge, say like, it's a huge number. Has there ever, has there ever been a judgment or settlement that big in history? Yeah, I, I Exxon, think there have, but like Exxon Valdez, I don't know what that yeah, was. <laughs> yeah. Well, inflation adjusted and everything else is, is a different story. But what people are neglecting is the amount of free cash flow this business already generates. So I just backed out. I think right now the yield is, I don't know, 4 or 5% or something on the dividend. That dividend payment every year is over $3 billion a year. So if they paid out that settlement 
at you know over a decade. It's basically saying you're going to have no dividend for a decade, but it doesn't impair the business's ability to compound capital in mid to high teens, if not 20s, like they have for the past 10 years. So the only question in the litigation from my standpoint is, do I own this business that compounds capital at 20% a year with a dividend or without a dividend? Because the underlying business is still going to grow. So um, so in, in my the way that I look at it is um, it'll get resolved. It'll get resolved and I'll keep the dividend. It will get resolved and I won't have the dividend, but the business will continue to compound. And at current multiples, uh, relative to the growth of the business and the mode of the business, I have such a large margin of safety. It makes no difference if I have a dividend or I don't. I prefer the dividend because that'll bring in that, that type of investor, et cetera, et cetera, and institutional support. But um, people are kind of operating like if they get this settlement and it's a worst case scenario, they're going to be out of business. And it's just no, it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. It's, it's like lunch money for them. That's what I said when Meta got down to, I forget where it got down to after Q3 earnings, but I mean, the stock was down 75% from the highs, if not more. I said they should just pay, you know, announce a 1% dividend. You know, yeah, it would have cost them a few billion dollars a year. But like you said, it brings in this enormous group of investors and funds and ETFs that can only own stocks that pay dividends. And yeah. I felt like that, bringing in that group of investors would have outweighed the cost of paying the dividend, but they didn't do it. So yeah. um, have you looked at Expedia? Uh, Expedia is is very interesting. Uh, we have looked at it for, uh, for the website. We were talking about the trade service. Uh, long-term, as a long-term major investment, uh, we're not there yet, but I think as a trade, it's going to work. I, I kind of like it right here. I think I, just, I think I just started a position last week. Yeah, it's basically flat on the year, so it's lagged booking and and um, and Airbnb stocks down like fifty five or sixty percent from the all time high, and it's trading with a free cash flow yield above ten percent. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. I see. I see all those things. It's basically uh, you get the most competitive. Um, uh, travel business, which I think there's still a lot of runway for the travel business. And oh, by the way, you get a free mini Airbnb on top of it. I right. mean, like there's there's not a whole lot to think about there. Uh, I think general market, to, uh, to, to put a bow on it, uh, we, we're kind of constructive. I know there's a lot to be worried about. And that's what the market's doing is climbing the wall of worry. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey every month. And you know, markets just don't top when managers are overweight cash and bonds. They they top when people are overweight equities Every, with leverage. Everyone's invested. Everyone's <laughs> feeling good. Then it's time to get nervous. Yeah. So, you know, th there's never a case where, <laughs> where uh, you know, the fire comes when everyone's sitting in the theater with an extinguisher in their lap, right? I mean, it's like when no one's prepared, uh, there's never an instance where it's like, <laughs> Right now, everyone's in T-bills, like, I'll just wait it out. And when the market goes lower, I'll take my cash and buy all the equities and get rich. Like everyone, like your, you, your Uber driver is thinking that right now. And when that happens, where's the pain, Jonah? You know, the pain right. is pushing the new highs and effing, you know, everyone. And, and, that, and all that these thinks... managers having to try to catch up on performance. Exactly. So, exactly. I mean, is that is that sort of the, that's the melt up, you know, base case or if we get a melt up is that why a melt up in the markets is because some of these managers just can't afford to sit on cash any longer they have to start putting it to work yeah there's no question and, and any bit of good news i mean you have i mean maybe mccarthy comes out with a bill that kicks the can down the road for the debt ceiling i don't know how much of that overhang is in the market i think there's some of it maybe big tech uh the guidance is less than apocalyptic you know that that could be a positive uh, maybe there's some type of resolution in Russia, Ukraine, like who knows, but no one's talking about anything that can go right. Everyone thinks it's talking that everything that can go wrong. Yeah. We know earnings are weak. You know, you didn't need to be a rocket science to know that the market was discounting that last year with a peak to trough, uh, a decline of 27%. Obviously earnings are going to be soft. The market discounts that six to 12 months ahead. And if you look at 2024, you're at 246 and everyone says, oh, that's ridiculous. It won't be 246. So it's 238. But even so, no one's starting to discount that recovery. And here we are going into May. Markets are going to start to look to that, you know, May, June, they're going to start to look to 2024 
And um, as a matter of fact, since earnings season, I saw some stuff out. I think it was Ned Davis or maybe it was Yardeni that um, estimate revisions were actually modestly up since the beginning of earnings season looking out. So we'll see if there's some of these green shoots. But I can assure you, based on cash levels and positioning, no one is, is looking for green shoots. And if they come, watch out. I mean, that's when people get forced into the market. And they won't get forced in at 4,100 or 4,200, wherever we're trading this minute. They're going to get forced in at 44, 45, 46. And you miss that 15, 20%. And many of them have already missed the 17% off the October lows. You can't make that back. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, real quick, talk to us about hedgefundtips.com. You also run that. Yeah. So hedgefundtips.com is a blog we run. We also do a weekly uh, podcast video cast, which has a lot of uh, hedge fund managers, institutional managers, ultra high net worth and, and regular uh, traders and investors listen in weekly. That's free of charge. Uh, you should uh, go to hedgefundtips.com, put your email in, you'll get a daily uh, update of the things that we're reading on a daily basis, the research. And then of course, that Thursday, we do the thir Thursday uh, research note in the morning you'll get, and then the podcast video cast in the evening once a week. And uh, people have found that really valuable. We're on like episode 184. So we've been going, awesome. you know, three plus years and uh, people seem to like it quite a bit. Real quick. As a matter of fact, in the hedge fund category, if you go to Feedspot, uh, it's ranked number one in the hedge fund category. Oh, nice. So small Congrats. niche, but people like it. So what's your favorite thing about running a hedge fund and your least favorite thing? Uh, I, you know, it's like people ask me, what would you do if you weren't working? I would do exactly what I'm doing right now. I love it. I mean, you know, I'm sure you experience it. You know, you just you either love markets and you love, uh, I feel like I'm on a treasure hunt every day. You know, I kind of the Buffett to skip to work every day. I'm just looking for high quality assets, compounders that are temporarily impaired, either to, to, uh, due to sector or market uh, general dislocation. And then uh, understand the bearish thesis before I, I put on a bullish position on. And then I'll look at the other bullish theses. So I'm not looking for confirmation bias. Uh, and then just wait for a normal reversion of, of a high quality business. And we covered a few of them today and there'll be more to come. But um, that's what we do. So uh, I would say that's probably the best part of being in the money management business. And I will say the worst part that most people don't like uh, dealing with clients, but I've been blessed to attract the right clients. And candidly, I've attracted them through one word of mouth, through satisfied clients. But number two, other people that just listen to the podcast for six to 12 to 18 months. I've had one guy came in last month uh, who's been listening for three years. And you know they finally come across, but they already know the mindset and they see how you have managed through um, different periods and different cycles in the market. So they, they're on board and they're of a similar mindset because the fact of the matter is, you know, we have a high minimum. Uh, um, so it's very ultra high net worth people, but they have all made their money with the same exact mindset, even if they're not in money management, even if they're in real estate and they bought high quality assets when they were temporarily out of favor, if they're rolling up companies, they did the exact same thing. So they they get the mindset and that's why they're already wealthy. Uh, and uh, and, we and they're willing to be patient, that. right? If you have a bad month or a bad quarter, you know, they realize it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And they, they know what they own because I've got, you know, I get full disclosure. I explain the theses. I explain why we own it. I explain what's changed, what hasn't changed. Uh, and they're on board and they, and they know we're buying high quality stuff. So uh so it just works over time and uh, and it's great. And, and it's what's beautiful is I track the type of people that, uh, number one, become friends that, that I'd want to hang out with anyway. Uh, so I really enjoy it. Um, awesome. I've, I've just been, been blessed in that regard. Glad to hear it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I assume you're in New York, right? Yeah, today I'm in New York and uh, we also have a place in Connecticut. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, we like it down here. Awesome. Well, great to finally catch up with you, Tom, and look forward to talking with you again someday. Thanks again, Jonah. Talk to you soon. Bye.